talk about Jamaica, but I wanted to give several of those the opportunity to just share a testimony about their experience there and ministering to the people of Jamaica. So I guess, Ken, why don't we start with you, and then Steve, why don't you come up, and then Jason, why don't you come up? You can all come up together and go like one right after another. Let's not make this a sermon or anything. <laughs> you come back from Jamaica before you know you start preaching sermons, which is a good thing. So come on up and share with the folks what you've learned. Good morning, everyone. Oh, I don't even know where to begin with the trip. It was just amazing. And I give thanks and praise to our pastors and the leadership there. They were great. For, there was a lot of running, boots on the ground. That's what I call it. It was really amazing. And I don't know, I guess the intimacy with my brothers here behind me was great, especially my roomie here and the other, the other second one in command here with me. You know? So praise the Lord for them. They really were helpful and showed their love. And the two young Christian gladiators I call David and Michael, uh, it was about Wednesday. And there's so much to talk about, and I just try to get to the point. But we were really fatigued. It was pretty bad. And uh, I believe Pastor called us, and we had a meeting about 15 minutes, and we sat in a room, and we prayed and prayed. And the Holy Spirit, I, I, it's just amazing how he worked through the whole trip. And David, it was amazing how I could just see how the Holy Spirit just grabbed upon this young man and shook him. And it was just amazing the the, the work that was done here, and it, it just, I learned so much, I, I just, I could go on a roll for an hour about it, about the love of the people there, how they worshiped, and I really learned more about love and the intimacy of my Lord, and I thank and praise my brothers here, because they were just, their love was and kind of taking care of me, I was a little beat up there, and, and thank you all again for all the prayers here, it was just uh, great to be supported, and I felt your prayers, and I love you all, and thank you. Oh, yeah, I'll go next since uh, Jason might take the rest of the afternoon. <clears throat> um, yeah, it was uh, it was a great trip. They're all great trips. Whenever we get together and uh, go for a week at a time with a bunch of brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. Um, but a real quick, uh, what would you say, overview of everything that went on. Um, you know, we landed on Saturday, we came back Saturday, but we, um, it started Sunday, like, like Kenny said, by Wednesday we were with, but um, basically we got up 6.30 in the morning, we had a Bible study for about an hour, we would um, uh, eat real quick, and then we went to, I believe, eight different schools throughout the week. There was two teams that would break up, and um, we would go to, uh, whether it was kindergarten to fifth grade or right on up to high school, there were, so two teams, Separately, we'd go to two different schools uh, from Monday through Thursday. And when we came back, uh, we would either go to a senior center, a hospital, um, what else? Uh, uh, a woman, you know, I was just thinking as we're sitting here singing uh, I'll Fly Away, the last time I heard that song was at the uh, women's center, and they were singing a lot louder than you guys. Um, it was something awesome. Um, so uh, then we come back for lunch, and before you know it, we're doing something again, and then we're getting ready to go out for um, every night. We went to two churches and um, preached at those two churches. Also, there was BBS every single day. So it was there was always something going on. We were very, very busy. But I really appreciate your prayers. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and just, uh, you know, praise God for the opportunity to be able to go. So. You're very practiced at that. That was soup to nuts, uh, what Jamaica was all about. Um, I was just talking with Angelica yesterday. We were talking about uh, the command in the Bible to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And I said, boy, I get that wrong so often. And uh, I think um, Jamaica trip would captivate that for, for us as a team to really be in that full-on mode of loving God with all your heart and mind and soul. Uh, certainly, uh, as Kenny stole my, uh, my boots on the ground, uh, that was mine, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Kenny and I had um, some great opportunities. We roomed together, and so every time Kenny would be sitting over in his bed thinking to himself, God, will you just work on Jason? Uh, I, I was also thinking that about Kennedy. <laughs> and, and then God would both work on both of us. Uh, so. Um, 
I think the, the highlight of uh, some just uh, Jamaican customs, uh, every time that you would uh, see a Jamaican during the day, they would say, good day. And uh, uh, in the evening, they would say, good night. Uh, so we had to get our head around that. Um, the, many people that we encountered loved the Lord. Uh, they, uh, as Steve said, uh, they, they worship uh, in ways that, that um, we found very refreshing. Um, we, uh, we went maybe to Jamaica with a mindset that we were going to do a lot uh, of work for the Lord, uh, but God has a way of turning things around, and uh, we came away blessed. We're so grateful uh, for our brethren here that prayed for us while we were in Jamaica. Um, we, we're, we're blessed to have, have you folks here uh, convening and doing that. Um, I would encourage anybody to uh, consider going to Jamaica. It, it is definitely a great experience. And uh, you'll come away um, realizing that maybe you don't love the Lord as much as you think you do. That wasn't too long. Hey, did you guys hear, did anyone hear when you were down here a thing that, where they said, no problem, man? Uh, they, they usually say that quite a bit. But listen, I don't think we should stop our prayers. Um, these men uh, went and uh, to, uh, to spread seeds, to sow seeds, and now the seeds have been sown. And even though they may not be there, let's pray that the seeds that they sow uh, reap rewards. So let's keep on praying. Uh, at this time, the uh, children can be uh, released for uh, uh, for uh, nursery, and so anyone uh, zero to four, if you want to make your way down, if you're up here, you may do that. Okay, gentlemen, if you could. Brother, would you pray for us? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day. Thank you for meeting with us, and thank you for the testimonies of the men that have gone away, and thank you for their, their work. Thank you for warming their hearts, Lord, and we pray that you would warm our hearts today. As Billy speaks, Lord, that you would give him words from on high, that you would touch our hearts, and Lord, a soul or two that may not know Jesus as their Savior today would come to know you before it's too late, Lord, and open our hearts to the gospel and help us to be warmed and be better Christians in our lives. would be different because of you and what your Son has done on the cross. Pray that your Son would be lifted up today in our midst, and Lord, that we would honor you with our tithes and offerings. And thank for meeting our needs. I pray that you would continue to. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs> gather together. Uh, at this time we'll have our scripture reading. <clears throat> Isaiah 42 16. When you have it, you may stand. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. 
I will make darkness light before them, and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them, and not forsake them. Let's have a word of prayer before the pastor comes. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your scripture. We thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, just saving us, Lord, for being here for us and for loving us. We ask you, Lord, as we go on to uh, uh, the rest of the service, as the pastor brings forth the message you laid on his heart, we pray, Lord, that it will reach each and every one of us straight from you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, to uh, give him boldness and 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 just strength as he as he brings forth the message. We thank you for everything. Be with us throughout this service. In my name, amen. Pastor. Well, good morning. I give praise to our God in the worthy name of Jesus Christ this morning. I'd like to... I'm not going to go with John, the Gospel of John this morning. I'll be there, Lord willing, next week. But I want to preach a sermon that I preached in Jamaica. I may have preached it here one time, too. I don't know. But it's a... I know what the Bible says is good. I don't know how well I preach it. But I know this account in the Scripture is one that has been very, very close to my heart. And I love to preach it. So, But before I do that, I want to bring a little bit of the spirit of Jamaica to you as... as best I can. I don't know how good I can do that, but I want to lead you in a couple choruses that we sang in Jamaica. So if you'd stand up, you're not going to know the words to these, but I need your help by means and by way of smacking your hands together, which we would call what? Clapping. Clapping. <clears throat> this first one I started on, I know I've sang this here before, so if you know it, sing it with me. You guys who have been in Jamaica, sing it with me. This one is called We Are Together Again. And I'm just going to keep flowing right from there. So clap your hands with me. And if you can sing, if not, just listen. You can imagine being in Jamaica, there's probably 30 to 40 people in a 20 by 30 building. And, and it's amazing. But of course, we are together again. Go like this. We are together again. Just praising the Lord. We are together again. Something good is gonna happen. Something good is in store. We are together again. Just praise the Lord. I feel good, good, good. I feel good, wonderful, good. Every time I talk about Jesus, I feel good, good, good. I've got my mind made up. And I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus Someday I've got my mind made up And I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus Someday Goodbye world I stay no longer with you Goodbye pleasures of sin I stay no longer with you I made up my mind To go God's way The rest of my life I made up my mind To go God's way The rest of my life That's how we That's how they sing in Jamaica But with playing at one time And it is It's just amazing They kind of just let it go and we can learn a lot from them in that area. On the other side of the coin, they can learn a lot from us uh, by the way we worship God through our music and our song. And so sometimes structure is a glorious thing. But sometimes structure can be harmful to the way the Spirit moves people. To see them people worship the way they do. They don't have any pianos or guitars. or They have tambourines. And some of them can play them really, really well. You wouldn't think you could do much with a tambourine. Go to Jamaica and see what they do with the tambourine. It's like, I can't even believe God is making that come out. Like, you little kids doing it. Amazing. You may be seated. <clears throat> you sing like that every week, and there's probably ten others that we could do. Ten other chorus songs like that, but they just keep going one after another just like that. And it's a beautiful thing to worship with them there. Usually it's an older woman who starts it off. 
and she's, she'll have a heavy, heavy accent and sometimes very high pitch. And, I will! <laughs> and everybody just joins in. It doesn't matter if you're off key or whatever, you know. And then you got a bunch of Americans there that are like trying to. Wait, wait, how, how are, wait, wait a second, we're off. But by the end of the week, you're like, it was good. I want to preach to you this morning. I want to preach to you from Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. Evan, the past two weeks, I believe, was in Matthew 20 about on the parable of the laborers. Listen to those messages. I thought he did a good job. <clears throat> But I want to preach to you this morning from Matthew 20, verses 29 through 34. By way of a title this morning, as you can see, I would say I would give you the persistent plea of faith. Hopefully you can see that as we read these verses. Let me read them, and then I'll pray, and then by His grace preach. And as they, that is Jesus and His disciples in a multitude, and as they departed from Jericho... A great multitude followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, that they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that are in. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I ask, Lord, that you would cause this passage of Scripture to speak to your people this morning. Lord, not only to your people, but those that may be here, whether they were invited by a family member, whether they were invited by a friend, whoever they are, Lord, they may not know you as Savior and King. And so I trust, Father, that even through these verses and this preaching of this gospel and these words may penetrate their heart, might cause them to see the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, it might cause them to turn and repent from their sins and to believe on Him, and Lord, for Your people, that it might encourage them and strengthen them and build them up in their faith, that they might worship and adore You more so than they did before they walked into this place. Lord, exalt your Son. Exalt Him in our midst that we might behold Him in all of His beauty and all that we might see Him. And by seeing Him, we would worship and adore who He is. I'll give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. As they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed them. Jesus Christ is on His way to Jerusalem. He's on His way to the cross. He's on His way to Calvary. I can't imagine what He has on His mind. I can't imagine the pain that He's going through even as He's on His way to go to Jerusalem. I know He's on His way to Jerusalem because of what verse 18 says in chapter 20. Jesus' words, verse 18 of chapter 20, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus Christ is on his way to Calvary. He's on his way to be crucified, to bleed, to suffer, to die, so that he can make atonement for the sins of his people. That's where he's going. He's busy. He's got a lot on his plate. He's got 12 guys, and I say this reverently, 12 dum-dums, if you will, following him along, just like you and I. <laughs> 
They're walking along with him and they often misunderstand. They can't figure out what he's talking about when he says he's going to the cross, when he's going to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. They start thinking, what in the world is he talking about? They have a wrong thinking of Jesus. They have a right thinking, just the wrong advent. They think Jesus is here to deliver them from under the oppression of the rulers, under the oppression of the Roman Empire and the government. They think that he's going to be exalted in such a way where he's a king and he's going to destroy and, and, and just make everything right. They missed the suffering servant. They missed him having to go to Calvary to be crucified. This is, this is the context that this is set in. And as they departed from Jericho, through Jericho, Jerusalem, so that he can do his cross work. And there's a great multitude following him. There's a great number of people following Jesus. It's amazing as you read through the Gospels, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as you read through them, you begin to realize that there's many people that follow Jesus. But a lot of those people are just subsurface followers. They don't have a true saving faith. They don't have a biblical faith. Because Jesus, many times, a crowd, a multitude starts to rise up. A multitude is following Jesus. He has a great following. And what does he do? He just starts teaching them doctrine. You remember in John chapter 6, the feeding of the what? 5,000. Probably above more than 5,000, counting women and children and so on and so forth. Probably much, much more than that. And Jesus says, I feel bad for them. He looks down and he says, he has compassion on them because they are like sheep without having a shepherd. And he tells his disciples, we, we should feed them. And the disciples, of course, look at Jesus and go like, are you out of your mind? How can we feed these people? How can we feed all of these people? And Jesus will just bring me what you have. What do you have? Five loaves and two fish. And what does Jesus do? He takes what they have and he, he, he gives thanks and he blesses it. And, and just, I, can't, I can't figure it out. I can't think how this must have looked, how this must have happened. But he gives that to the disciples and go, go feed them. And, and they have these baskets full of bread and fish, and they're passing it out to people. Here, here's some for you. You want, you want a fish? Too? Here's some fish for you. And, oh, here's, here's some bread. Well, we're, we're getting lower. We're getting out. The basket's not full anymore. What are you? And we go, here, 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 you have it. Oh, here's a fish for you. You want some? The basket's full again. It, it's full again. Here you want some fish. And it's full again. And by the time they're done feeding all of those people, they gather up 12 baskets extra. Amazing. Amazing. And those people, as well as the disciples, missed the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Mark tells us that. Jesus sends his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. He goes up into a mountain to pray. And at night he comes walking across the sea in a raging storm. And what do the disciples do? It's a ghost! We're going to die! We're afraid! Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me. Why did that happen? Because Mark tells us they missed the miracle of the loaves and fishes. They failed to recognize the majesty of the person of Christ. As well as the multitude that was there. Because they wake up in the morning and they, they say, Hey, where's Jesus? We're hungry. We want breakfast. Where did he go? And someone says, I saw his disciples pass over in some other boats. Well, if he went, if his disciples went over on some boats, let us get into some boats and follow him over. Can you imagine what it must have looked like that morning? Charge! After Jesus, 5,000 people rowing in these boats across the sea. They come across the other side. They get there. There's Jesus. Hey, where'd you go? We hungry. 
What does Jesus say to them? You don't seek me for who I am. You seek me because you're hungry. I am the true bread from heaven. If you're going to come after me, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus isn't talking about cannibalism there. He's telling them the importance of entering into a relationship by faith and faith alone and what he's going to do on Calvary's cross by sacrificing himself and shedding his own blood. And by the time they're done with that, all of the multitude that followed Jesus, what did they do? This is a hard saying. Who can hear it and then walk away? Beloved, we live in a world that wants everything from Jesus. As long as he's given them all the physical things and the desires that they can have, they'll follow him. But when he says, oh, you got to partake of me to have eternal life, they say, we don't want any of it. And they walk away. When Jesus says, if you really want to be my disciple, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me, people say, that's too hard. To live the Christian life, to live holy, righteous, and good, to, to, to walk as Jesus walked, and to have the creator of heaven and earth change you from the inside out. People say, I don't want that. I love my sin. And they turn from the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ to go for the pleasures of this world. Jesus turns to his disciples. I'm preaching John 6. I didn't even preach in Matthew yet. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Will you go also? Notice very carefully. Notice very carefully. What, what does Peter say? Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? Not to what shall we go? To whom shall we go? Peter has an understanding. There's no one like you who's going to deliver us from our sins. Who's going to make us new? Who's going to forgive us of our sins? Who's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Who's going to do for us what only you can do? Whom shall we go to? There's no one else. There's no one else. There's no one else but Jesus. Do you know that this morning? Do you know that your only hope is Jesus Christ? Do you know that whatever you turn to is not a whatever, but it's a whomsoever? To whom are you going to turn to have eternal life? Whom is that that's going to give you that? There is no other name under heaven whereby which men must be saved, but by the name of Jesus Christ. So these followers that are following Jesus... Many of them are just subsurface followers. We live in a world that is mixed with both wheat and tares. That's the world. That's not the church. That's the world in which we live. We are Christians. We are wheat living amongst tares. And those, that wheat and those tares are going to grow together. And at the end, God is going to send His laborers down and they're going to separate the wheat from the tares. And the tares are going to be joined together and thrown into the fire. And the wheat is going to be gathered together and stored in His barn. Realize and recognize the value of the majesty of Christ. It's the only way to get out of the fire. It's the only way to dwell in the kingdom of God forever and ever. It's the only way to have peace with God. It's the only way to be made new. It's the only way to have a life that is worth living. Because in the end, beloved, no matter how good a time you have here on the face of this planet, if it all winds up and ends up in the end in a lake that burns with fire, what have you profited? Jesus' words. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
but lose his soul. What have you gained? Don't be one of the great multitude followers of Jesus. Be intimate with Him. Be full of faith with Him. Believe and trust on Him. And I think that's what these two men here do. There's not many days that go by that I don't think of these, these blind men. There's, there's not any week that goes by that I don't think of at least several people that Jesus has come into contact with. These two blind men are one. The other one is the woman who had an issue of blood. There's not many days that go by that I don't think of her. How full of faith she was. How she, she If I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just reach out, I know he's powerful enough. I know he's strong enough. I know that in his person and who he is, in all my infirmities for 12 years, with all the doctors and all the money that I spent on trying to be made whole, certainly he's the only answer for me. And if I can just reach out and touch him, I'll be made well. And she does that. And she's made well. The woman of Canaan that comes out to meet Christ and she cries out, same thing these men cry out, Jesus, Lord, thou son of David, have mercy, my daughter is greatly vexed with a demon. She, she's, she's messed up. She's being controlled by wickedness and evil and there's all kinds of, she's greatly vexed with one. Jesus pays no attention to her. He, t he turns and he walks in and, and sits down. So much he doesn't even make he doesn't even make eye contact with her. You think that would have been it? <laughs> Here I am begging him, and he turns away. He doesn't even answer. But she's full of faith. She doesn't turn away. She doesn't run back home. She keeps on pounding and hounding the Lord Jesus Christ. So much so that she goes to the disciples. And the disciples come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, send her away. She bothers us now. She comes and she kneels at the feet of Jesus and she says, Lord, help me. And Jesus says these words to her. Woman, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. It is not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. If that were you or I, who do you think you are? I'm coming here to try to get help. I'm out of here. You think she would have walked out, but she's full of faith. Full of faith. Full of trust on this one who even in his words which are sharp and somewhat hurtful, she's not going to let go of him. That's what saving faith does. It lays hold onto Jesus Christ. You know what she says to him? Truth, Lord. Humility. She humbles herself. She bows at his feet. You're right, Lord. It isn't right to do that. But even the dogs do beg bread from the master's table. She understands who she is, and she understands who he is, and he's worth fighting for. He's worth praying to. He's worth humbling yourself. He's worth bowing down at his feet. He's worth hounding and hounding and hounding and hounding until he has mercy and grace. She knows that. Woman, you have great faith. Woman, you have great faith. Are there any better words to hear from the lips of the Savior? Isn't that what you would want to hear from the lips of the Savior? You have great faith. You're not just going to tuck tail and run at the first hardship. You're not just going to give up when somebody says something to you that might be a little hurtful. You're not going to get all bent out of shape when somebody comes and says, hey, that's not right for you to do this or that or the other thing. You're going to continue steadfast, pressing on, laying hold of Jesus Christ. 
you know, saving faith doesn't give up. It doesn't stop. Yes, it gets discouraged. Yes, it sometimes looks weak. Yes, sometimes it seems like you're a mess and all kinds of things are bearing down and weighing down on you. But when the rubber meets the road, saving faith says, Lord, only you can do something about it. And I rest there. The thief on the cross is another one. I got saved from that passage of scripture. The thief started out hurling insults at Christ. Ah, if you are who you say you are, take yourself down off the cross and us with you. But he comes to faith. By the grace and the power of God, this man comes and he turns to Jesus Christ and he calls him Lord. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He rebukes his fellow thief and says, we deserve to be here, but this man has done nothing wrong. He repents, he turns to Christ, and he lays hold on him. He recognizes that he's a Lord. He recognizes that this one dying on the cross, that's not the end of him because he has a kingdom he's going to. He understands something about Jesus Christ. And he repents and he believes. I know I'm going to see that man one day in glory. Because Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. There's not many days that go by that I don't think of these, at least those people, if they've impacted me, especially here, these two men. Behold, verse 30, and behold, look, put yourself there, come with me now, walk through Jericho to Jerusalem and see what happens. Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside when they heard that Jesus passed by. They cried out, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. These two know, they know something about the Lord Jesus Christ. They cry out to him, they say, Lord, have mercy on us, thou son of David. They understand something about who this person is. He's David's greater son. He's the one who is going to sit on the throne. He is the Lord. He's the only one that, that can help them. He's the only one that can take them from their blind condition and bring them into light. The very name they call him signifies that. Lord, thou son of David. To back up just a little bit, what an important time this is. Here Jesus is passing by. Jesus is walking by. Jesus is going through Jerusalem. These two men sat by the gate there and they begged in their blindness, in their darkness, in their condition that was poor and wretched and ugly. And Jesus right now is passing by. And what do they do? They cry out. They cry out. Beloved, Jesus is passing by. Jesus is passing by right now. Jesus is passing by. Will you not cry out? Will you just, you just let him go? Be the only one that he's passing by right now. Will you not cry out? These men, in faith, they have strong and they cry, Lord, have mercy. The foolishness of the world has Jesus come this close and then they just say, no, walk right on by without crying out. These men cry as Jesus is passing by. They cry out, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And this is an amazing thing. Verse 31, this is an amazing thing. This blows my mind, but I've actually experienced it. As they cry out, verse 31 says, And the multitude rebuked them that they should hold their peace. The multitude comes to these two blind beggars who are crying out to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they basically tell them, Shut up! 
Don't call for the master. Don't cry out to him. He's busy, you know. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's going somewhere. He don't have time for you. Why don't you just be quiet? And the reality is, beloved, we live in a world where when someone starts to cry out to Jesus, the multitude is going to tell you to shut up. The multitude is going to say to you, don't call on that name. The multitude is going to say to you, you don't need to do that. Just keep quiet. We don't want to hear you crying out for Jesus. You may have family members, friends, co-workers, relatives, whatever that is. But when you start to cry out on Jesus, many of the responses from the multitude are don't cry out to him. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. And don't have a weak faith, but have a strong faith. Notice what these two men do. Good thing they didn't listen to the multitude, huh? Good thing they didn't go, oh yeah, oh, hell yeah, well, sorry, yeah, oh I didn't realize he was so busy. Look at, what they, look at what they do. Verse 31, the multitude rebuked them that they should hold their peace, but they cried the more. <laughs> That's faith. It doesn't matter who tells me to be quiet. It doesn't matter who tells me to shut up. It doesn't matter if the whole world says, no, your Jesus is false, your religion isn't right, your faith is a farce. It doesn't matter who says what. I know Jesus is passing by and he's my only hope. And when they tell me to be quiet, I'm going to cry out all the more. Amen? That's what faith does, beloved. That's what saving faith does. When the religions of the world says, hey, Jesus isn't the answer. Saving faith says, it doesn't matter what you say. i got to cry out to you. They cry all the more, saying the same thing. Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. This is amazing. Maybe one of the most amazing verses in all of the Bible. Verse 32. Look at it. And Jesus stood still. How do you stop God in his tracks? How do you stop the creator of heaven and earth in his tracks? How do you cause him to stand still? You cry out. He, he's, he's got a lot on his mind. He's busy. He's, he's going to be separated from his father. However that can even happen, I don't understand it fully. But he's going to be scourged and he's going to be beaten. He's going to be spit on. They're going to pull his whiskers out of his head. And he knows all of that. And yet two blind men say, Lord, have mercy. And as his busy schedule is taking him to Jerusalem so that he can go and be crucified, he stops in his tracks. The Lord of glory stands still for two beggars. For two beggars. Listen to me. If he did it for them, why wouldn't he do it for you? You might be here this morning. You, you don't know Christ. You, you don't know anything about him. You might be playing games with God. But if you cry out, in simple faith and say, Lord, I know I'm wrong. I know I'm blind and I need you to give me sight. I realize you're passing by right now. Have mercy on me. He'll stop. Jesus, Jesus doesn't say, sorry, I'm too busy. I gotta get to Jerusalem. I have a cross to hang on. He doesn't do that. He's right where he needs to be. He's right where he wants to be. He's right where they, he's available to them. Beloved, our God is not a God who can't be reached. Our God is not a God who, who can you have to cross oceans and lands and see that you have to have some kind of special phone plan to get to him, a long distance plan. He's not that distance from us. 
So much so that when a sinner cries out, Jesus will stop. He stood still. And he called them. He called them. In another book, I think it's Mark. I think it's Mark 10. <laughs> they go to this man and say, Be of good cheer, the Master calleth thee. <laughs> I'm so glad God called me. I'm so glad God, God said to me, Come. <laughs> and that's effectual. The reality is, beloved, that God calls with a universal call. God says to the whole world, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and what will I do? I will give you rest. That's a universal call. Universally, God is calling out to every man, every woman, every child, Come unto me! Come unto me! Come unto me! And they will not come. But there is a call from God that is an effective call. It is an effectual call. He knows who his sheep are, doesn't he? And his sheep hear his voice. And when he calls, they come running. He called these blind men. <laughs> Have you been called? Calling is a part of our salvation. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Moreover, those whom he did predestinate, he also what? Called. He calls you to himself even now. And now if you're one of those blind people, you're sitting there, you're blind, you can the only thing you can see is you, you hear the multitude coming and all this. And, and, and Jesus says, come to me. What do you do? What do you do? Well, I, I can't see. Sorry. I'm just not going to be able to make it to him today. You get up, you fumble, and you bumble, and you stop. Just get me to Jesus. Right? That's what you would do. If you were blind, and the only one that was there that can heal you, fix you of the darkness that you're in, and you were blind, and he said, have them come to me, you wouldn't just sit there. Get me to Christ. Get me to Him. Get me to where I can bow at His feet. Get me to where I can be touched by Him, embraced by Him, loved by Him, where I can experience what He's going to do. Because that's what sheep do. That's what faith does. That's what saving faith does, doesn't it? Whatever I have to do to get to Christ, I'll do it. Yeah. If, if you're a sheep and Jesus is your shepherd and you're laying in the back 40 somewhere caught up in a thicket and you can't get out them briars and those pickers got you all wrapped up around you and they're wrapped around your neck and they're wrapped around your furry woolly gut and your legs are all tangled up in the briars and you hear the voice of the shepherd calling. You hear the voice of Jesus Christ calling. And he says, Kenny, Kenny, John, John, Tammy, Tammy. What do you do? What do you do as a sheep? You go, Bah! I'm over here, Lord. I'm stuck in the thicket and I can't get out, but I'm so glad I hear your voice. I'm so glad you came to seek and save me, amen? That's what sheep do. That's what saving faith does. It doesn't quit. It doesn't give up. It doesn't say, oh, it's too hard. It's too messy. There's no way I'm going to know. It says, Lord, have mercy. And when Jesus calls, you go run into him.
Jesus, Jesus says these words to him. What will you eat that I shall do unto you? Is it, is it really that simple? Is it really that simple for Jesus to say, what would you like me to do for you? You notice their reply. They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. I'm sure they had a lot of other great needs. I'm sure they were beggars. I'm sure they didn't have a home. I'm sure they didn't have any place to, to stay, to lay their head. They probably didn't have a lot of food. They certainly didn't have a lot of money. So they recognize and understand their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is they're blind. So you notice what they say to Jesus after Jesus says, what would you like me to do for you? You would one might think that well, as, as a beggar, they would say, Lord, if you would give us money, we, we would be grateful. If, if you would be able to support us, maybe put us up in the local hotel for a year or two, we, we would be really grateful. Lord, if you, if you would just help us out of the difficult situation that we're in, because it's very difficult, you know, to live as a beggar here in this place. If you could just somehow, they don't do any of that, do they? They, they get to the root and the heart of the problem. Lord, we're blind. We, we are blind. And we want to see. The reality is, my friend, if you're here without Jesus Christ this morning, that's who you are. You're blind. You can't see. Don't, 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 don't think. Don't, don't run to Christ with secondary issues. We, we have not because we ask not. And when we do ask, we ask amiss. These men didn't ask amiss. They didn't say, Lord, just get me out of my troubles. Lord, just give us a little food. Lord, just put us up in a home. Lord, they didn't do that. So we're blind. The reality is your condition this morning apart from Jesus Christ is you're blind and there's only one who can open your eyes. But that's the reality of your problem. You're blind. You can't see. And only He can give you sight. So don't ask amiss. Don't waste the Savior's time by asking for secondary things, for little things like houses and lands and money. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritual bigot. Help me. That's a good prayer. Lord, I'm not a humble man. I'm full of pride. Take me out of the darkness of pride and arrogance. That's the heart of the issue. I'm lost, and I want you to save me. What do you want me to do for you? That's what he asks them. They say, I'm Lord, that our eyes may be open. I'm almost done. So, more, like amazing words. So, Jesus had compassion on them. Jesus had compassion on them. He, he, you don't know what you ask. That's a pretty big order to open the eyes of someone blind. Listen, I, 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 I'm on my way to Jerusalem to be crucified and make atonement for the sins of my people. I'm going through a heavy time, and I'm sorry, I just can't help you. He doesn't say that. He has compassion on them. He loved them. He, in other words, he wanted to do for them what they needed. Their request was a right request. What they asked him to do, he desired to do it for them. Amen? He had compassion on them. He wasn't hard-hearted. He didn't say, well, you know, you're not like the man born blind. Apparently you saw a little bit before, and that's enough grace that you need. I'm not going to grant your request. He doesn't do that. In other words, he's full of compassion. His desire is to make them see. Jesus has compassion. He is a compassionate Savior. 
He's not a hard taskmaster. He's not ruthless. He's not inconsiderate. He's, not, he, he's one who is touched by our infirmities and our own sufferings. He himself put on flesh so that he can understand and know what exactly it is that we go through. And he is able to help us. He has compassion. Don't ever think of God as the one who is the heavy. The heavy. We're living in a time in a day, you want to call it a dispensation. God is dealing out to us right now an, an open door. And what he's saying right now is come. Come. Just simply repent and come. He's asking you right now, what do you want me to do for you? How much more do you want me to do for you? I mean, the veil in the temple is torn in two. The, the, the door to heaven is wide open. There's only one way to enter in through that door, and that is my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I delivered unto death, that you might believe on Him and be saved and just turn to Him and trust and believe and lay hold on Him, and you will have eternal life forever and ever and ever and ever. That's the time in which we're living right now. Don't get me wrong. It's not that God's wrath is not being poured out. It's not that God's judgment isn't being delivered. That's happening too. But it's in a time, in a place, in an area, in a period of time where he's saying, you can come to me. You can come to me. But beloved, that's not always going to remain open. There's coming a day when that door will be closed. And then you won't have any more time. There'll be no more salvation. There'll be no more opportunity. Don't, don't, don't miss it. Understand and realize the compassion, the long-suffering, the mercy of your God in, in reaching out with His hand to you right now to offer you this great salvation. And He's simply saying to you, what, what would you like me to do? You want to be saved? Here's salvation. It's found in nobody else but my son. Believe on him. That's compassion. As he has compassion on them, look what it says. <clears throat> and he touched their eyes. What happened to their eyes after he touched them? Immediately. Immediately, their eyes received sight. They had an encounter with Christ. They had an experience with Christ. They came and knelt at the feet of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ did something to these two men, you can guarantee it happened, and it happened immediately. It didn't take months or weeks or days or years for them to see. They saw immediately. Beloved, if Jesus Christ has had compassion on you, and if he has touched your soul, and you now see, you've seen immediately. All this idea of Christianity where, where one can say, I believe in Jesus, but nothing has happened in my life as of yet, but I'm still a Christian that, that's not Christianity. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I understand. I still have a lot of sin in my life. I will have sin for as long as I wear this stuff around. Daily. But let me tell you something. When Jesus touched me, something happened immediately. I may not have fully understood it, I may not have fully comprehended it, but something changed, and it changed immediately. You begin to think different. You begin to speak different. You begin to act different. You begin to do different things. You begin to hang out with different people. You begin to love what God loves and hate what God hates immediately. I remember when I was a young Christian, before I was a Christian, I had a mouth like a truck driver. Dirty, dirty mouth. 
And I can remember hanging out with some Christian men. And I'd be sitting there and I'd be talking and carrying on a conversation and all of a sudden one would slip. Might have even been the F-bomb. Just slip. And man, you know, ah, good godly men and I'm not letting that one slip. And they never said anything to me. They never rebuked me. They never took me aside and said, hey, you know, your language, you better start cleaning it up. A couple years later, I talked to one of the men. I said, you know what? Why, why didn't you pull me aside and tell me that? He said, we already knew God was God had already changed your heart. We knew you were slipping. We knew that you were coming out of the life in which you once lived to the new life that Christ has given you. We didn't have to correct what God already was fixing. Isn't that beautiful? Something happened immediately. He touched their eyes. Immediately their eyes received sight. And what did they do? They followed him. They followed him. They didn't go traipsing after a religion. They didn't go traipsing after... The, we're now uh, members of the church of Touched by Jesus Christ. Let's start a new cult. They didn't do that. They, 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 didn't, they didn't divvy up the, the, the idea of, well, this happened to us and we're going this way and I know you guys are the Calvaryites and we're the Jerichoites and we're staying here as you guys go to there. And No, they followed Christ. They went where he went. Where he goes, they go. They followed him. This is the essence of of what saving faith, this is a picture of it, a very beautiful picture through a real account of the scripture to show you what saving faith really does. Are you going to heaven? Yeah, I'm going to heaven. Are you following Jesus? Because if the answer to any one of those questions is no, then you're not a Christian and you're not going to heaven. That's harsh, I know. But this is the reality of what saving faith does. It follows Christ. It follows Him all the way to Calvary. It follows Him through adversity. It follows Him through suffering. It follows Him wherever He leads. Goodbye, world. I stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. True saving faith follows Christ. I hope this has happened to you. If it hasn't, Jesus is passing by. If it hasn't, cry out to Him. If it hasn't, know beyond the shadow of a doubt that He will stand still. If it hasn't, know that He is full of compassion. If it hasn't, know that if He calls you and He touches you, something will happen to you immediately. Know that if it has it, when it has, you'll follow Him. And if it already has, worship Him. Praise Him. Give all the glory.